last week, um, we were talking about Zacchaeus, um, and I will apologize, Stevie Bates, for, I did say Nicodemus at the end, at no point was I ever talking about Nicodemus <laughs> during that. If I say Nicodemus, just fast forward to Zacchaeus, because that's who I'm talking about. Um, but I think that last week, as we were talking about positioning yourself for an encounter, this week... I wanted to talk about how we respond to that encounter, how you respond to the encounter. Um, so last week I was, the Lord gave me this message, why do you watch from afar when your miracle is at hand? Uh, position yourself for an account, encounter, maybe a, even if you had a desire to change, um, and how Zacchaeus put himself in a position for an encounter. So this morning, um, Mark, can I grab that mic from you? Thanks. I'm just going to have uh, my own Ava Elvin come join me. She has something that she wants to share with you about in, as a response. Um, and tomorrow is her 16th birthday. So we're just celebrating Ava. And I just, last week when I, when I closed out the message and I knew... Cr- Pastor Chris was going to be here this week. He sends his blessing. He loves you guys. He wants to be here. He's in Auburn pastoring right now. So, but he sends his love to you guys. And uh, so I know he's really missing out. But I know that Ava has a word for you this morning for real quick. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, so God really placed in my heart a testimony that I had about two years ago when I was 14. It was actually this two, two years this Wednesday. Um, and I was sitting there, it was a Wednesday night service, and Pastor Chris and Didier Tassan were here for kind of like a pre-prophetic conference, uh, event, and they were talking about all these things, like the fivefold ministry and all this stuff, and then all of a sudden, I received this, like, mental clarity, so it felt like the veil was just, like, totally torn away, and I truly believe that was when I became a new creation. God changed my mindset. He changed my, the fog. Sometimes as a teenager, you feel like the fog, you don't understand everything, and it just, like, went away. And so, to me, that was truly a miracle. Like, it was, it was absolutely, like, it changed my world perspective. And today, Dad, he's going to talk about the response to your miracle. So after I had that miracle, I was, I had to tell everyone, I was like, I'm all in. I'm all in for Christ. Whatever he asked me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And um, after that, I went on my phone. And everything that I felt like my spirit was conflicting against, like the Holy Spirit was telling me, like, get rid of that, get rid of that. I was like, okay. And I just deleted everything that I, even if it wasn't, like, bad, if it conflicted my spirit, I just got rid of it. And the peace that you walk in when you listen to the Holy Spirit and you don't, reject what it has to say to you is absolutely freeing. So today, I think the word of knowledge is if you have your miracle and you're obedient afterwards to what God has for you, the Holy Spirit will lead you. If you listen to that, you will live in freedom. And you can stay in the freedom. Instead of miracle, you have your miracle and then fall back into it. Don't fall back into it. Just listen to the Spirit and it will guide you into freedom. So, thank you. Amen. Thanks, Ava. Wow. So, it's time to clear the fog. I'm here to clear your fog. That's what I want to do. I want to do that. I don't want you to leave here unclear. I want you to leave here clear. I want you to leave here with crystal clarity in your mind about who you are, what your purpose is, and what you're doing. That's our job as pastors. We love you. We want to see you succeed in everything that you do. Do you want to succeed? Okay. All right. So let's take off here. So last week, like I said, we were talking about positioning yourself for that encounter. So your response is crucial. Um, I'm going to start out, I, so we can't respond correctly unless we know our identity. And so I know that we, 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 I mean, we go after identity in this fellowship 150%, okay, 150%. 
Because it starts with identity. If you don't know who you are, how are you going to operate? It's like a piece of machinery. If you don't know how it works, how are you going to operate it? So I'm on the phone the other day with Mr. Mike Teed. He knew this was coming. I'm on the phone with him. He had this meeting at his house, and I just called him, and he invited me, and I couldn't make it, and I'm really upset that I couldn't. And uh, I called him. I said, Mike, how'd it go? Oh, he's going, you know, it's over the top, and he's telling me all these things. And, and, but then the last part of what he said was, you know what I'm really trying to get across? That we can't measure our lives by our successes. We measure ourselves by our value. And I was like, Michael Teed. That, that's, I mean, it's so true, right? So if I measure my successes and you measure your successes, what are we doing? Uh, I'm, I'm measuring myself against you, right? Comparisons and we're competing, right? But values don't compete. You know, the value of gold is the value of gold and the value of silver is the value of silver. They can't compete because they have value. So now this morning, I want to ask you, what is your value? But your value is inside your identity. That ceiling of value will only go as high as your identity. However high you want to go, it's going to hit the ceiling how you think about yourself. So my prayer this morning is that you would find your identity, not just your identity. I, I, okay, identity is one thing, but in value is another. And when I think about how the Father values me, and the way that he looks at me when Kate Hofline was singing that song this morning, the faithful until the end. And I have to read that. I wrote, you're a, you're a treasure woven by his love. So he just didn't put you, put you together. He wove you together. Why do we weave things together? So they don't fall apart. This, it's so simple. This is so simple. It's like basket weaving. He puts you together so you won't fall apart. So why do we keep falling apart? Why? Because you're letting yourself come unraveled. And you're not finding your value in yourself. But as soon as you have that salvation, as soon as you walk into Christ, as soon as you find that identity, as soon as you find a new creation, you put yourself back together. The song, you put me back together, you picked up all my pieces. Different song. But why do we sing these songs? You know, I was sitting there talking with someone the other day, I can't remember, but... I was talking with someone and I was talking, it was driving me crazy, like how much we talk about like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the bad stuff that happened in the Bible. What about Timothy? What about Paul? What about all these guys that were writing the Bible and they were only including these things to say, don't be that. <laughs> but we concentrate on what not to be and we're not concentrating on what we are. Let's concentrate on what we are. I could care less what those Pharisees did. I could care less. Because when I was reading Luke 19, he was eaten with a chief tax collector. Not just a tax collector. That means he had other tax collectors underneath him. Zacchaeus I'm talking about. Chief tax collector. I told you that's the only place in the Bible where you'll find chief, well, in the New Testament, chief tax collector. Inside the, inside the country of Israel, they were most likely Jews. So his response was so amazing. 
Before we go to his response, though, we have to go to 2 Corinthians 5.14. I think we'll have it up on the screen here. Yes, we do. Thank you very much. We're in the Mirror Bible. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, The love of Christ constrains us and resonates within us, leaving us with only one conclusion. When Jesus died... Every individual simultaneously died. In God's logic, the word, one has died for all, thus all have died. Verse 15. Now if all were included in his death, they are equally included in his resurrection. This unveiling of his love redefines human life. Whatever reference we, we could have of ourselves outside of our association with Christ is no longer relevant. It's no longer relevant. Your opinion about yourself is no longer relevant. This is just the Bible I'm reading. That is good news, babe. Verse 16, therefore, from now on, I no longer know anyone according to the flesh. I no longer see people with a human point of view. This is a radical and most defining moment. No label that could possibly previously identify someone car carries any further significance. So at people that you're thinking about, how often are you the Sadducee? How often are you the Pharisee? I'm talking about Nicodemus and how he put himself in a position for an encounter. He put himself in a position for it. I went over Jericho, Jericho last week. It's like San Diego. It's like Florida. People that had second homes, that's where they went. That was what? That was where the money was. So I'm sorry, Zacchaeus. <laughs> Nicodemus would have done the same thing. He also put himself in an encounter in a secret meeting with Jesus. And he said, what is this? What are you doing? He knew he was Christ. So he knows, Zacchaeus knows where the money is. So he positions himself, right? I told you about tax farming. You bid. So Zacchaeus bid on Jericho and parts of Judea. He would win the bid. And when you win that bid... That means you have all these tax collectors under you that are collecting taxes. The problem was is that everybody knew that this was corrupt. And the tax collectors would say, they would know, oh, I need to, let's talk about U.S. dollars here so I don't confuse anyone, but I'm going to collect $200 from you. That's, the, that's what I need to collect. But what I'm going to collect is $250 because I want bigger money, money Bill. I want bigger money. So they get greedy and they start pulling that in, but then they pull it all in and, you know, then the money goes to Zacchaeus and he goes, well, I'm the chief tax collector. So, and he's telling all these guys what to get. Oh, 200, get 250. Yeah. You keep 10, give me 40. We're going to get to that in just a second. I got to finish reading second Corinthians though. At the end of verse 16, even our pet doctrines of Christ are redefined. Whatever we knew about him historically or sentimentally is challenged by this conclusion. What conclusion? Verse 17. Now, in the light of our co-inclusion in his death and resurrection, whoever you thought you were before in Christ. You are a brand new person. The old ways of seeing yourself and everyone else are over. Acquaint yourself with the new. Your version may say, if anyone is in Christ. And I want to challenge you to think a little different this morning. I want you to take that word if, and I want you to know that that's not a condition, it's a conclusion. If you're in Christ, and you are, it becomes a conclusion. It's not a condition of life anymore. It's not winter time. It's not springtime. It's not a condition that you have to work yourself into. It's what you are. 
It's a conclusion. Amen. 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 Wow. Say it's a conclusion. conclusion. All right. We're going to move on quickly to Luke 19. Um, We're going to go into verse 6 because I I want to stick right here with, uh, with Zacchaeus. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 5. Luke 19, verse 5. I'm still in the mirror translation here too, sorry. Uh, as, well, I'm not going to apologize for that. Um, but I'm here. As soon as Jesus was under the tree, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down quickly and take me to your house. I would like to spend time with you. Verse 6. He was down in a flash and welcomed Jesus into his home with great joy. The crowds were rumbling with disgust, like a disturbed hornet's nest. How dare he lodge with a notorious sinner? Newsflash, they knew who Jesus was. They didn't want him to be king, but they knew who he was. Why were they fighting so hard? Verse 8. Zacchaeus stood his ground in an effort to defend himself and said, Lord, I give half of my income to the poor, and even if anyone accuses me falsely for overcharging them, I restore to them four times more than what they accuse me of. He was a chief tax collector. I was reading in a different, I was reading in a different place where this was just like, this was like, the, his way of saving face. If I have cheated anyone, I'm going to return that money four times. He cheated tons of people. So it's only up from here. Verse nine, Jesus responded, today salvation has come to your house. Mr. Innocent, you too are a son of Abraham. This is my mission as the son of man to search out those who are at their wits end in their futile efforts to justify themselves trying desperately to clear their name. Man, how how have you tried to clear that fog that Ava was talking about? How have you tried to clear your name before? Isn't it crazy the ends that we go to to try to clear our name? I have come to their rescue, and I will help them rediscover their authentic identity and redeemed innocence. How powerful is that? So we had talked last week about all the taxes and this response. His response was to give half to the poor and four times to whoever he cheated. We talked about the taxes, and they would collect the temple tax, and they would, and they would collect the crop tithe. That was the Israel tax. And then you had Rome, and I wrote some of these down this time, where it's the, the crop tax. People, just for being a citizen, people tax. Transportation of goods tax. Sales tax. Inheritance tax. And business license fees. They had all these taxes. And all the scholars, as they've been looking at this, they're figuring out that they've been taxed from anywhere from 50 to 80% of their annual income. Yeah. So Zacchaeus had this money, probably living in some sort of palace. And here he stands. This is his response. Because he positioned himself. Remember, we're positioning ourselves for an encounter. And then once we receive that encounter, how do you respond to it? How do you respond to that encounter? So check this out. Let's turn over to Leviticus 6. So here he is. I, wanna just, I don't want to talk about the half. I want to talk about the four times because we see this four times. And, I, and I, we, so we look it up in the Bible. Where's four times? What's the law say about this? Because they're still under Jewish law. Here, the, the Torah is what they're, this is what they're reading, right? So what does the Torah say? So if I go to Levit- Leviticus 6, verse 1, 
The Lord spoke to Moses saying, if anyone sins and commits breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security or through robbery, or if he has oppressed his neighbor or has found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely in any of, in any of all these things that people do and sin thereby, if he has sinned and has realized his guilt and will restore what he took by robbery or what he got by oppression or the deposit that was committed to him or lost thing or, or the lost thing that he found or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore in full and add a fifth to it. That's 20%. So why is he saying four times? So then if we go over to Exodus, Exodus um, 22. Exodus 22, verse one. If a man steals an ox or sheep or kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox or four sheep for a sheep. But this is talking about an animal. This isn't talking about money. Money goes back in the, in, well, actually, for, fast forward in the Levitical law, in the Torah, it's talking, about four, it's talking about two times. The only place you can find four times is here, until you get yourself over to 2 Samuel 12. And when you get into 2 Samuel 12, So prophet Nathan, he comes in. David's done some stupid things. Nathan, the prophet, comes in rebuking David and says, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had uh, had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little... You, uh, you lamb, which he had brought, which he had bought, and he brought it up, and he grew it up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsels, and drink from his cup, and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to a rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for a man who had come to, the, to him. So this is right after David and Bathsheba commit adultery. And David sends Uriah the Hittite to be murdered, the husband of Bathsheba. David said, then David ang- it's a Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold. Fourfold. Because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And I think that it's very interesting That David says this. David was installed and he was the first part. He was installed as the monarch. He was the king. He was the beginning of the lineage of Jesus. And there he sits. Did what he did. He says, I'll repay four times. Zacchaeus says the same thing. He says, I'll repay four times. There's a man by the name of David Stern. He writes in a uh, Jewish New Testament commentary. He says, a man stealing what is essential and is showing no pity, but was required to pay back fourfold. Zacchaeus, fully repented, not only acknowledged the heartlessness and the cruelty of his behavior, but voluntarily imposed upon himself the whole restitution required by the Torah for such acts. Wow. Wow. So here he is, returning four times. And why? 
You know, in Luke and in a lot of the Gospels, they don't ever use proper names. And when they use proper names, it's for a reason. Zacchaeus' name was mentioned. Zacchaeus' name is Zacchaeus, and it means innocent, clean, and righteous. And Zacchaeus was none of these things until his encounter with Christ. Jesus' name, Jeshua, is the Lord's salvation. In verse 9, Jesus says, Today, salvation has come to your house. Salvation has come to your house. So here's a man stealing money. And he says, I'll return fourfold, just like David said, return fourfold. At the beginning of the lineage, it was fourfold. At the end, Jesus was going into Jerusalem to die and hang on the cross. It was fourfold. And Zacchaeus' name, meaning clean and pure and innocent, and Jesus' name means salvation, righteousness, meant salvation that day. And he said, today, salvation has come to your house. Jesus didn't die yet. Why? Why is all this unfolding? Why is all this happening? You know, because I would say in the Greek that when it says salvation has come to your house, it means salvation has come to your house. (laughs) Salvation came to Zacchaeus' house that day. Jesus was the end all for the Torah. He was the end all for the law. He completed. It was a complete work. Two times for financial, four times for stealing an animal, or five depending on the animal. In comes David for what he did. He didn't even know what Nathan was talking about at the time. He was so mad about it. And then Nathan, it says in verse 7, he goes, I'm talking about you, dummy. That's what he says. Not dummy. I put that in there. But he says, I'm talking about you. What are you going to do about you? And Zacchaeus, he repents, it says, with a fully repentant heart. He goes, I'm still going to give back four times. And he says, today, righteousness meets salvation under this roof. Righteousness, true equity with God, met the salvation under one roof. Pure and innocent. So there's a threefold response here that Zacchaeus has. The first, don't get mad at me about this. The first is he had a repentant heart. He had a repentant heart. And I think that we take a look at repentance in a different light. We feel like as soon as we get saved and we've done our repentance, that's it. And now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, yeah, I, I don't come up here and drop on my knees every single week. I, don't, I drop to my knees because my king is my savior and that's who I worship. I don't drop to my knees for any other reason or for any man. But what I drop to my knees for is 100% surrender. And I say, Lord, my life is yours. So when I think about repentance, what repentance means is return to the path. That's all it means. That's all it means. Don't put any other definition to it or you're going to be living by the law. The law is accomplished. The law is finished. But there's sometimes that we return to the path. You've lost your way. And it says, I just step back onto the path. Lord, what did you have for me? Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't, I lost my whatever. But you know, and then what he did, what did he do next? There was a reconciliation and there was a restoration in Zacchaeus. So first he had a repentant heart. And then he came back and said, whatever I did, I'm going to repay. And even more, all he had to do for the Torah was two times. And he says, no, I'm going to do it four times. 
And he said four times, even before Jesus said, salvation has come to your house. He had made up his mind. He had made that restitution inside of his heart. He made that resolution, the, uh, you know, the, the, the reconciliation, how it was going to go, and why. Why did he do it? He encountered God. He encountered God, and God showed him exactly what to do. And he says, I'm going to repay. But why? Mm. My God, you're so good. He did it because now he's able to have an impact on people's lives. Because everybody around him knew that he only had to repay two times. And when he walked back and gave them four times, that's going to have them pose a question to Zacchaeus. Why are you giving me four times? You only owe me two. His ability to have an impact on that person in every single person that he meets as the reconciliation and the restoration. You have to remember, I was talking to you about the Halikia last week, about the stature, and we think that Zacchaeus got up into a tree because he was a short man. Well, maybe he was a short man, but one of the definitions of Halikia in the Greek is social status, low on the totem pole. He was kicked out to a tree. He wasn't allowed to see Jesus. They wanted him out. He was stealing their money. He didn't want to be in a crowd where he could possibly get murdered. He didn't want to be in a crowd, but he wanted to see Jesus. So he got into a position where he could see and he started running and climbing. I told you last week, there's no man in the first century that is going to run and climb a tree. That's for children. But he did. He made himself look ridiculous. And then there's Jesus. Come down from that tree. Have dinner with me. And in the first century world, when you had dinner with somebody and you broke bread with somebody, yeah. Brother Leon, we, we break bread. Friday morning, we broke bread, didn't we? And you know, as we travel in the third world, we talked about this Friday morning, that, that when we would preach in Malawi and different places, the windows would fill up. Everyone was trying to get in. Everyone was trying to hear the goodness of God. Everybody was trying to, what's going on? What's, who are these white people? Some of it was that. But some of it was, what are they saying? What is, what is the message of God today? What's he saying to us? And I believe in the windows of Zacchaeus' house, it was filled with people. They're all surrounded because all the people of any prestige were, they were, they were fluffing their pillows and getting their house ready because they knew Jesus was coming because he was on his way into Jericho and the children were all seeing him. Go ahead, he's coming. Salvation is coming. Jesus is coming. He's coming right now. Get your houses ready. And everyone's trying to get their houses ready. And then he looks up at some chief sinner and says, you, Zacchaeus, Come down from that tree because it's my business to have dinner with you. It's my business to have dinner with you. And he went to his house and he broke bread. And it was a sign of covenant and love. So how often are we standing there in that window? And we're not at the dinner table with Jesus. Stop standing at the window. Don't stand at the window anymore. Sit at the table. It's your job to feast with Jesus. <laughs> we had threefold response here. He repented. He returned to the path. There was reconciliation and restoration with those he wronged. And then he had an ability for impact. Now, I'm just going to take a little side note here because we're talking about tax collectors. And it all starts off in Luke 3. Can we turn to Luke 3 real quick? Mm. (laughs) This is John the Baptist. My man was crazy. This dude's eating locusts and honey and in his underpants, baptizing people. 
camel fur or something. Oh, I got to find where I am. Where am I, Stacy? Three, verse seven. Thank you. Oh, this is my favorite. Now, can you imagine this? John is outside the city. John the Baptist is outside the city baptizing people. And people are coming. Tax collectors. Mm -hmm. This is the first place you find the tax collectors in Luke anyway. So like I said, you have to read Luke as a story from start to finish. You can't just stop and pick and choose. Okay? So if you read it right through, I told you, chapters and verses didn't exist until the 16th century. This is a book. This is an an account. You know, there might be chapters in a book, but really, if you take the chapters out, the story still happens. So here we go. It says (laughs) in verse 7, John's favorite message to the multitudes coming out to be baptized by him was offspring of vipers. Who showed you this perfect escape route? away from the reach of her intended passion. Verse eight, now bear fruit that matches the awakening of your authentic identity. Why is identity even there? It's it's what you need. It's what you are. Your authentic identity. Now bear fruit that matches the awakening of your authentic identity and your redeemed innocence. Quit seeking the origin in Abraham. Your true lineage is found in God's faith, not in Abraham's efforts to bear children. Abraham was the father of many nations. We'll keep going. See beyond mere flesh and discover God's power, raising the offspring of Abraham unto these stones. Verse 9, most certainly will the very cause of problem of a distorted identity be uprooted? Oh, sorry, I posed that as a question. I'm supposed to be hollering because that's an exclamation point. All my essential students are yelling at me right now. (laughs) Most certainly will the very cause of every problem of distortion identity be uprooted. Every tree that did not produce good fruit is about to be axed and thrown into the fire. The roots of those patterns, uh, thought patterns that controlled your life are powerfully addressed in the Metanoia Reformation. Skip over that. Then the throng of people desired to know how this radical mind shift would impact their practical lifestyles. This is what I'm talking about right here. The practical lifestyles. We all have jobs. We all do something. We're all members of society. I want you to know that when Jesus left the house of Zacchaeus, he did not tell him to stop being a tax collector. He didn't tell him that. Barry, he didn't. What's interesting is that John already addressed this in chapter three. Here it is. He said, those who have more clothes and food than others should should now see every opportunity to share what they have. Also, a party of tax gatherers came to be baptized. There it is. The tax gatherers came to be baptized. And they too wanted to know how this would play out in their lifestyle. That was their job. That's what they did. Verse 13, John explained. To now live... From your, uh, re- from your redeemed identity and innocence will radically impact the way you deal with money matters. You no longer want to take any more money than the prescribed amount. And that would be the taxes. So he, he deals with them right there. Later on, 
you know, it almost makes me wonder. Makes me, I'm just wondering here, okay? Wonder with me for a second. I think it's, it's good to wonder, but I'm wondering if maybe Zacchaeus came out there. And he's saying that. And then he has this response, right? He has this extravagant, like holistic response. And he says what he says. And I believe he did what he said he was going to do. But he has this huge response. Jesus never told him to stop collecting taxes. And that's why I wonder if he was there and maybe he got baptized. It's just speculation, but I like it. <laughs> but still, at the end of the day, it's the same for us all. It's knowing our identity. It's knowing who we are. It's that if is not a condition, it's a conclusion. You know, a couple testimonies are response to my own life. I remember years ago, um, there was a bunch of us here. I think Blake was there, myself, uh, a couple other people. I don't remember. AIM, I think, was there too. But um, a friend of mine, uh, Roy Fields, called me and said, hey, can you come play for us? We're up in Albany, and uh, we have this, these meetings going on. I wasn't in a very good state at that point, but I said yes. And we went and played, right, Blake? And uh, we got into this church, and we played. And I remember, I just, I was searching, and I was just searching in all the wrong ways, and it was just, and I'm talking about God. I was like, God, just get me out of this. And the whole time he's saying, I've already gotten you out of this. Just step out of it. I've given you salvation. I've given you the Holy Spirit. I've given you everything that you need. Now all you need to do is rise to the occasion. And I couldn't seem to rise to the occasion. But I wanted an encounter. And I remember... We were in the middle of the song, and Roy was just right across from me. And he was playing, and we're jamming away. I was playing bass. Blake's right here playing drums. And I just remember there was this moment, and I wanted this encounter, and I got to my knees. I didn't just get to my knees. I fell on my face. And I remember there was all this music playing around me, and I'm like, what is Roy doing? What's going on? I just kind of like came out of this, like, whatever it was at my encounter, I guess, and I was like, what's going on? There's all this music playing, and we're all on the ground. Roy was on the ground. I thought he just had a sustain pedal going, and he was just, you know, rrr, 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 with some little pad synth thing that he was doing. It wasn't. He was on the ground. And I looked up. This music's going on. I, I had this encounter. I had this moment. And I remember Roy's wife came up and she said, there's somebody going through this. You need to respond now. You're going through it. You, this is your time of deliverance. She, said, she was talking to me. I didn't have the courage. I didn't know what to do. So I just sat there and I missed my window. And then continued to give up a couple more years of my life to some issues that I could have dealt with right then. I could have responded to that call. And I could have been set free. But I couldn't see the value in my life. I couldn't see it. But I was calling for an encounter, and God gave me an encounter. And He put Melanie up there, and she was calling, and she was calling, and I was like, Lord, it must be for somebody else, and it must be for somebody else, and it was for me. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't answer. And I went through this period of life and had to struggle. But then I remember crying out for another encounter. 
and we were getting ready to have a miracle pool service down here. And I just want to see people healed, man. I want to see people delivered. I want to see you set free. It's not your portion to be walking around the way that you are if you're in a crippled state. It's not your portion to be walking around with a head cold. It's not your portion to be sitting around with anxiety. It's not your portion to be sitting around with any mental illness. It's not your portion. It's not what God called you to be. As long as you're in that state, you can't be at your true value. Because you have all these impurities that are just bugging you. And I want to see all these things go. And I want to see them drop. So I got on my face before God. And I remember I was in this room and I just laid my head on the wall. And because I was studying Catherine Kuhlman at the time, and I don't know if that was a good idea or not, but she got off the stage and she hurt one of her bodyguards a test or had a testimony, I should say, that there she was on the wall and he heard her talking. And she says, he goes, I, I couldn't write here. So I got closer and I got closer and all of a sudden I heard her say, Lord, why couldn't you heal them all? Yeah. And then the Lord spoke to her and said, I'm having you heal them all. So I'm in this room and I'm saying, Lord, I want to see them all healed. And he gives me this vision of like a big orange orb. It was the weirdest thing. I don't, I do dream. I don't remember anything I dream about. I'm a dream loser. I shouldn't devalue myself like that. I'm a dream, I'm a dream winner when I have them. Or remember them. But I remember this vision and I'm like, Lord, what? is this? I felt like I was staring into the sun. Like, what is going on? It was like white, just flashes, almost like, you know, like the starbursts or whatever they call them coming off the sun. And he said, those are the healings that you're asking for. I said, oh, thank God. I drove to church and we were going to get ready for the miracle pool. We were going to set up and I was like, oh, I'm just going to get there an hour early and just get in the prayer room. So I just started blasting some music and I just fell on my face again and I saw the orb again and there was more things and I could see different things that were happening. And so I was like, oh, this is awesome. And people that night got set free and people that night got healed. But it was all because I wanted to encounter God. And then it was all because I saw my value. And then it was all because of my ability to respond. And then because I did respond, those healings took place and those deliverances happened. So I bring up the, the issue of jobs and stuff with tax collectors. He didn't say, he didn't, he's not telling you to stop doing what you're doing and become a preacher. Stop doing what you're doing and go into this business. Stop doing what you're doing and go into here. Now, some of us are entrepreneurs and we get different ideas. And, you know, I'm sure Rachel, she didn't have the same idea her whole life. It was a development, wasn't it? It's an entrepreneurial spirit that just is on some people. And they just grow businesses. There's many of us in this room that have had different businesses, and that's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. So many of us in our businesses aren't encountering God because you're not asking and you're not valuing yourself. And the devaluation of yourself is saying, I can't ask God for the encounter. But God's saying, son, daughter, you can ask me anything in my name, and I want to give it to you, because everything that I have for you has been prepared in heaven. 
And anytime you need to grab a hold of something, I want you to be able to grab a hold of it. But in order to grab a hold of it, you have to understand who you are, right, Mike? You have to understand who you are. And when you understand the value that's on your life and how God sees you, you begin to see who you are. And you begin to see that value. And that value is not for you. It's for everybody around you. It's for everybody that you come in contact with. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Success. And we can say, Lord, we thank you for the success in our lives. Can we all stand? I just want to pray over you this morning. Excuse me. But I just want to, I want to pray over you guys this morning. And if there's anybody that, you know, this message spoke to and you would like for us to pray for you, we're here. I have Mark and Eve and Dave and Amy and all the pastors of the house that you just gave flowers to, we want to give them back. <laughs> we appreciate the flowers. We, we, we appreciate the tokens. We, we appreciate the things that come to us. And it's because of you. And it's because of your giving. And it's because of your tithes and your offerings that we're able to do what we do. In a, and we're here for God's kingdom. If there's one thing the big Papa Chris instilled in us is that we're here for his kingdom because we are his glory and we are his righteousness. So if this did resonate with you and you want personal prayer, we're here for you and we want to pray for you. Mr. Hudson, how you doing, buddy? You know, God's going to do great things in your life. He's already preparing ways for you. He's already preparing ways for you, dude. I, I just see like all these paths in front of you, just like your dad and his thoughts and all the things in the camp and stuff that he's doing. I just see there's so many trails in front of you and you're able to take them all. God wants you to be so successful. Yeah. But most of all, he wants you to see your value. <laughs> Hudson, he's valued you beyond you could, anything you could ever imagine. True. And he loves you. And you have such a loving heart that everything that you do just spews kindness and spews love. And it's going to fall on everybody that you come in contact with. And one of the biggest successes of your life is going to be that love and that ability to love in every hard situation. You're a blessing, bro. Well, wow. well, Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for encounters. Wherever we are, Father, if we need to repent or return to the path, let us return to the path. Father, we, we want to be in your will. If you've given us words and rhythm and you give us this encounter then we're going to write a song. If you put tools in our hands and, and lumber, and we're going to build a house. Because you've given us the ability, Father. Father, I thank you for the ability that you put inside of us. And it's not just the ability that you've given to us, but Father, it's the testimony of the value that we have in our lives that builds one rock upon another upon another, upon another, that we have this sure foundation that we don't need to turn our head to the right or to the left. But Father, we stay fixed on you. We stay on that path that you've given us. Father, there's many here that are on the path. There's no need for repentance. We're on the path that you've given us. Father, let them run. Yeah. Let them run with strength. Let them run with value. Let them see themselves. Even people that need to come back to the path. Come back to the path. Come back to the path. Father, I thank you that we are on a path for your kingdom that is all about your kingdom. And Father, I thank you that your kingdom isn't somewhere out there. It's right here. We're running in your kingdom. We're about our Father's business. So Father, we're about your business. Your son called your kingdom 
a business. So, Father, I thank you that you keep us in line. You keep us in line. That as, as we try to veer any which way, keep us focused. Say, keep me focused. Say, keep me focused. Father, I thank you for focus. I thank you for value. Father, I just thank you for the ability. Anything that needs to be reconciled or restored, I thank you for reconciliation in relationships and business. I thank you for restoration in businesses and inside of relationships and families, Father, because it all starts with family. Any reconciliation needs to happen in this community. Father, anybody watching online, let it happen now. Let people see, Father. Let them return to the path of your way. Because I thank you, Father, that in that house, that under that roof of Zacchaeus, that innocent and purity, that cleanness, that righteousness met your salvation, Father. And salvation has come to our house. And we rest inside of your salvation. Father, I thank you for the rest. Thank you for the value. Thank you for the way that you see us. I thank you for our identity. So Lord, I thank you for all these things. I just bless this house. I bless my community, my church, Father. I thank you that we are blessed and we will continue to be blessed, Father, because your hand never comes off. It always stays on. And it's our job to stay under that hand and move with the hand, Father. I thank you for the blessing of this church. In your mighty name, amen, amen. You guys have an amazing week. Be blessed in all that you do. Amen.